Hi everybody, I'm Jackie Bantel and I manage the Horticulture Field Lab here at the University of Saskatchewan. So welcome. We are on site here just off of 14th Street and we have about 70 acres of research area. I've been here quite a while, longer than I like to admit. Initially I was going to stay for less than 10 years and it's going on 30 now. But anyway, I am a graduate of the University of Saskatchewan, the horticulture program. And I started here as a technician working in vegetables. And uh, then I managed to land a job uh, managing the horticulture field lab and the agriculture greenhouse. We do a lot of research here. We research fruits, vegetables. We have Patterson Arboretum, which looks at trees and shrubs. And so there's always something going on here. Welcome and enjoy the tour that you're going to have with uh, some of our faculty. I'm Bob Bors. I'm a professor at the University of Saskatchewan in plant sciences. I teach several horticulture courses, but I'm also in charge of the fruit program. And this is a spot where many of our plants begin. Uh, this is, we call this a shade house or a screen house. It maybe lets in half the light of normal, which is good for plants coming from the greenhouse, they don't get sunburn in here, but it's also good for plant propagation. So these uh, plastic things here, they all have cuttings in it where we're propagating stuff. And farther back there, there's uh, younger seedlings that haven't yet gone out in the field. In this bed, this actually has a timer on it and it'll do mist every 15 minutes. I, it may be turned off now because it's the end of the season, but. This particular one just happens to have mostly hazelnuts and looks like high bush cranberries back there. But we'll do cherries in there, hascap, all most of our fruit plants will start them like something like this. And then uh, when they get going, we'll put them in a larger container. So these are cherry seedlings. Uh, this is typically what a farmer would buy. Like they'd buy a thousand of these for an acre. Right, and you plant them a little, you can plant them a little bit deeper, but our cherries will give you, be bushes. And uh, we're, we have a plant sale where we raise money for uh, horticulture. But we also have apples being uh, propagated there in the big star blocks. There's, those are younger ones, and there's bigger ones back there. We have coleus that I breed in my classes. And uh, rather than pay the greenhouse bill in the summer, we move them out here and kill some of them off out here <laughs> and take less back. Um, these are much younger cherry seedlings over here. Right? They've just barely rooted. They haven't had time to grow like these have. And uh, farther back, we have hascap and stuff. But this facility is also used uh, when the vegetable program has seedlings, they take from the greenhouse. In the greenhouse, they don't get much UV light. But you come out here and they won't get sunburn and they, they live here for a week or so and then you can put things in the field. But it's also a great area for plant propagation. This is a berry harvesting machine. Uh, and it's one of the things that really sets our fruit program apart from most of them in the world was that, um, well, I had a job at the USDA working with rotting fruit, working with an engineer who was developing harvesting machines. And actually I hated working with the rotting fruit, like spores would be flying everyone. My, uh, the days I worked with penicillin, I would come home itching all over. And that inspired me to go to graduate school and quit doing that stuff. <laughs> so I went to University of Guelph, majored in fruit breeding, came here, and I really had that mechanical harvesting on the brain. Like, how can we get people to pick berries? We should have a machine. And an earlier version of this was the most popular one for Saskatoon berry growers to use. But this type of machine, is really innovative because it, it pushes branches over. The fruit only has to drop like a few inches, right? Other types of machines are upright and this would be upright and your fruit might drop two meters and go splat. So this is a machine that hardly causes any damage to the fruit. So I started in the breeding looking at which one of our cherries could fit in this, which one of our hascap 
You could also use this machine on black currants and raspberries and aronia if you grew aronia. But we were actually the first people in the world to ever harvest Hascap with a machine and the first ones to do this type of machine with cherries. Cherries, they usually have something that grabs a big trunk and shakes it like that, but we grew bushes. That was something that's really key in our program is to decide what can a machine pick because young people do not want to go out uh, and pick berries. I asked, I asked my students at this point, how many of you think it'd be a great job to go picking berries all summer for a job? <laughs> You know, and very few people ever raise their hands, right? Nobody wants to do that anymore. So anyway, that this cost seventy thousand dollars. The earlier version was only forty thousand. It cleans them. They go in a conveyor belt. Up there is a big fan that blows off leaves and insects, and then it comes out on an assembly line. If you have a big fat caterpillar as heavy as your berry, it will still be in there. So you still have some people to look at it, right? But it really cleans the fruit off pretty well. This is some of the equipment we use at the horticulture field lab. A lot of different sized tractors because you might have rows really close. When we have grants, we put usually 15% into this fund. And also when we sell our plant varieties, 35% of the royalties go into a fund that a lot of it goes to buy new equipment. And uh, one thing that's different about our university is royalties from plants don't go to the breeder or to the administration. They go to the program, 65% of the program and 35% to mostly equipment fund. So every time someone buys a plant variety of ours, it makes our programs bigger. Okay, so we're standing in front of uh, a Carmen Jewel cherry tree, which is the first variety released uh, by our program in 1999. And some people accuse me of being the father of the sour cherries here, but I'm really more like the godfather because there were three generations of professors before me that worked on this, right? Uh, the first guy, Les Kerr, actually worked for the for the federal government and he was breeding cherries against the wishes of his superiors and hiding them at people's farms and when he was about he was actually dying in the hospital he called one of my predecessors over and told him which farms to visit to get his best cherries right so we gathered them up and bred them to other uh, other cherries from northern europe and when I got here in 1999 and I saw these cherries, I got really infatuated. I, said, I thought to myself, we could probably mechanically harvest them. They're on their own roots and they're only this tall, right? Most cherries are three times taller than this. So I went to an international conference with two years of data, two years later, how big are cherries, how tall they were, their sugar levels, acidity and all that stuff go to the International Cherry Conference. And I was in shock that they made me the first speaker after the keynote speaker. And I had not given any talks like that to scientific people. And I only went to the conference to learn what I was doing wrong, <laughs> right? So I get up there, talk about my cherries. And the lady in the front row, I mispronounced all the German, all the names of the varieties from Europe. I gave them French accents and they should have had German accents, right? So <laughs> uh, I sat down, nobody asked me any tough questions. Like no one said, well, why are you doing this? Or, and the next speaker from Denmark started it and he said, our sour cherries aren't as big and sweet as Saskatchewan sour cherries, but, and that's how he started his talk. And I was like, I could feel the, the blood draining out of my face. And I felt like I was going to pass out. And the guy next to me nudges me and he says, I'm a physiologist from Hungary, so I'll tell you the truth. Your stuff is probably the most exciting stuff at this conference. 
the breeders are all going to be worried now that your stuff is going to move to Europe because most of the people there are from Europe. That is fantastic. And so I next devoted the next seven years of my career here to studying the sour cherry, wrote a cherry manual, you know, getting them publicized. So it's been really exciting because when I got here, I think a lot of people were confused with, they were used to big sweet cherries from uh, BC and they thought these little things, you know, they're only the size of a nickel or so. But they didn't, re people here didn't realize that the sour cherry is a cherry that's in pies and wine and everything you cook with that has cherries and half the ice cream. They can put sweet cherries in ice cream, but sour cherries are more common. It's the one that everyone makes stuff with. So it's actually more popular around the world than sweet cherries. <laughs> so anyway, we, we have the romance series. Romeo and Juliet, that, uh, those are going kind of big, and the Musketeer series. And we're actually the northernmost place in the world where sour cherries are being bred, or the coldest place. Uh, we're much colder than Germany that's breeding them, much colder than Denmark. So it's really a world breakthrough that we have them. And also they fit in that machine that I showed earlier. Right, but we have to prune them the right way. These aren't pruned properly. We found some of our cherries uh, that fit that machine better, and then some of our cherries fit other machines. But they, they ripen in uh, usually early, beginning of August. Some will be end of July, some mid-August. But there's certainly a breakthrough in breeding that was done clandestinely by, by Les Kerr and then improved with uh, further breeding. We're at one of my largest Hascap fields. We have about seven fields here. Uh, it's our largest crop. We earn more royalties from this crop than anywhere else. And we're actually considered world leaders of Hascap. And Hascap is really a fun crop because it can be machine harvested. We were the first people to do that, to harvest by machine. But it's also one of the most nutritious plants it beats blueberries, often twice as much antioxidants on average. But it's hard to compare, like some people say Hascap is twice as good as a blueberry or three times or four times, but it depends on which, if you're gonna compare the best Hascap to the worst blueberry, but you can find some blueberries that are just as good as some bad Hascap. So I think it's like, uh, when they say antioxidants, it's like, my, my fruit has more vitamins than yours, but not saying which vitamin, right? Maybe it's got more D and E and C, but not A and B and stuff. So I think really you should eat lots of different fruits. But one of the reasons where um, this crop actually grows globally around the Northern Hemisphere in very cold locations, it can take minus 50 easily one of the reasons we're a big program in this is we got material from Russia and Japan and I had a sabbatical gathering across Canada. So we have the most diverse collection. And early on we found that if we hybridized berries with long skinny ones from Russia with short fat ones from Japan, we got some long fat berries that were bigger than either parent. And uh, ours tastes sweeter. We found some low sugar ones, and uh, it's just been a fun thing to do. We have, it's not in this field, but we have some that, um, there's a variety of this that grows twice as fast, but it tastes disgusting. It tastes like tonic water concentrated. And that was the kind that was first grown in Canada and killed interest in this crop. Meanwhile, the Japanese and Russians were improving it, we didn't know there were better tasting ones. But when I came here in 1999, we had a few plants of the good ones. And so that is what inspired me to get into it. So like that, that big row of plants there, the big ones, that's the variety Aurora, which is actually the world's most favorite variety. The more people are planting that than anything. And it was all developed right here on campus. 
My name is Kate Congreves. I'm a prof in the Department of Plant Sciences here, and I research sustainable and environmental horticulture. So I'll do things like measure soil health, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as nitrogen cycling. And so we're interested in how to measure these things, but also how to manage soil health and, and better manage and mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and uh, how to better manage nitrogen, uh, both for kind of balancing agronomic benefits, but also minimizing uh, negative environmental impacts as well. So a lot of my work will look at um, kind of finding that balance between agronomic and environmental benefits. Uh, here, right now, we're standing at the potato trial. So this is uh, year one of a three-year trial. We're looking at uh, nitrogen use efficiency as well as phosphorus use efficiency. And we measure uh, stuff in the soil, nutrients in the soil. We look at um, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we're also measuring uh, the cycling inside the plant leaves and in the plant components. We'll, we'll dig up these potatoes once they're ready to harvest and we'll measure the nutrients in the tubers and kind of do a mass balance of, of nutrients that way as well. So right now, Olivia's getting it all set up. So the chamber bases are already installed. She's got a chamber base in the furrow, and she also has a chamber base on the hill. And so she's putting the chambers on top of the bases and sealing them down. And that is what lets the gases build up and so that she can collect a sample. So right now we've got the greenhouse gases, if they're being produced from the soil, you know, the microbes are working away, producing some greenhouse gases. It's giving it a chance for that, those gases to actually build up in that headspace of the chamber so that she could pull the sample. So usually, you know, Olivia has got a big trial, so she has to do every single plot. So she sets that one up, she's got a timer on the go, and she goes to the next one and, get, and gets it all ready to go. So same process on the next plot. So Olivia's coming back to the first plot that she had had set up and it times up. So she's going to pull the gas sample right now. And so you'll see that she has a syringe. And the gas chamber uh, head, it actually is fitted with uh, a little opening. So she can put that syringe directly into the chamber right now. And she's pulled her gas sample. Now that she has that gas sample in the syringe, we want to bring it back to the lab. So she's putting it into an excitator vial. And those vials she's prepared already in the lab earlier this morning or yesterday, and they're evacuated, so there's no air in them at all. And the only air that's in there is the, the air that she actually took from that chamber, and she's put that sample into the vial. We're going to bring those vials all the way back to the lab, and we'll analyze them with GC, so gas chromatography, and we'll get information on the nitrous oxide that's in that sample, the carbon dioxide that's in that sample, and, and any methane that's in that sample as well. Olivia does this not every day, but almost every day at, at our other site. And so she's got potato, wheat, canola, pea rotation out there. And so she does this very routinely as a part of her masters. So Daphne's pulling some soil samples right now. And what we do is we bring those soil samples back to the lab and we measure the nitrogen that's in them. So we will identify the total concentration of soil nitrate as well as soil ammonium. And you can see that she's, she keeps going. So we did the 0 to 15 centimeter depth and now she's doing 15 to 30 centimeter depth. So we've got surface soil as well as subsurface soil layers. And again, we'll measure nitrate and ammonium concentrations in that depth increment as well. And she can get even deeper here, 30 to 45 centimeter depth. Daphne is working on her undergraduate thesis with us. She's looking at nitrogen cycling, nitrogen use efficiency, as well as phosphorus use efficiency in this potato trial. So how did I get interested in horticulture? It really started when I was a kid. I was in the garden a lot with, uh, with my parents and I would just play in the garden with the soil and move it around all around the crop roots. And I would also play around with the plants. Uh, and of course I would work in the garden too and actually contribute towards harvesting, harvesting the food. Um, but I do remember one time my brother and I took a bunch of pumpkin seeds and we walked out to the old compost pile out back and we just scattered them and the results were magnificent. 
And so I think I kind of carried that into the, the rest of my life, that, that interest in the interaction between plants as, and, and soil. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in biology and chemistry at Queen's and I had awesome opportunity to work with some uh, fabulous women in science and they uh, gave me the opportunity to do an undergraduate thesis in, in pumpkins and so I continued to work with pumpkins at that point. Um, but more on the environmental side, so using pumpkins to phytoremediate PCB contaminated lands and so that really sparked some interest in me in research. And then when I continued on to my graduate studies I looked more at that balance between environment and, and agronomy and uh, looking at coal crops, so broccoli production and how to better manage nitrogen in, in broccoli production. And much of that really has carried on to, to today and uh, I have the fantastic opportunity to, to supervise and, and work with a whole bunch of awesome students who get to work with uh, the environment and, as well as agronomy. Welcome to the Agriculture Greenhouse here at the University of Saskatchewan. This greenhouse is used mostly by the College of Agriculture, but we often have other uh, researchers in here to do research on plants. We have 15,000 square feet of growing space, and it's used mostly by um, grad students and faculty members to do uh, research throughout the year. We run 365 days of the year, and we actually have three seasons within the greenhouse. So people start planting in January, and then usually they harvest their crops by the end of April. We plant again in May, harvest by the end of August, and then plant again in September and harvest at the end of December. You can see the brown pipes that run along the roof of the greenhouse. That's how we heat the greenhouse. There's a boiler system under the greenhouse. And we cool the greenhouse by using evaporative coolers throughout the summer and into the fall and in spring. The other way we cool the greenhouse is using vents and that's our first method of cooling. And sometimes even in January when it's minus 30 outside, we have a sunny day, we actually have to open up the vents because it gets warm enough in the greenhouse to have to cool it. So this greenhouse that we're in right now is, uh, feels very humid. If you were in here you'd be like, oh, it's kind of warm, I don't like this place. but. Uh, what we're doing in here, there are two main reasons um, we have high humidity. One is we are propagating plants. And so as you can see in this bench, we've got plastic on the sides, we've got a cover here. We've got some mist, uh, mists that come on about every 30 minutes for about 15 seconds. So it keeps it very humid. Under this mat that we have in here, we also have a heating coil. So it keeps it extra warm. And the reason for that is plants like uh, when we're taking cuttings, so these are actually different types of cherry plants, we've taken cuttings off of a plant and we will just stick them in some soil and provide really high humidity, some warmth underneath. We put some rooting hormone on them and the idea is that they will form roots. So this is really important in a lot of horticulture plants because um, think of the apples that you eat. So for example, if you like Macintosh apple or delicious apple, that uh, all the apples that we have in the world from that actually originated from one tree that was bred. And then to get that same tree again, they actually had to clone it. They take cuttings of the tree. You don't get it from seeds, you get it from cuttings. And so that's why that's really important in the horticulture industry. And so that's what we use this for, propagating plants. Sometimes we have little seeds like strawberries. If you've ever looked at a strawberry, you have the little seeds on the outside of the strawberry. They're very hard, difficult to germinate, and so we put them in here, give them high humidity, they don't dry out when they're germinating, and then they'll form a new plant. And over on this side of the greenhouse, we have lentil plants growing. And these lentil plants are all different uh, lines of lentil plants. And so you can see, if we look in here, some of them, they're starting to get a disease on the leaves. So they're breeding lentil plants that will be resistant to certain diseases. And so what they do is they grow the plants out, then they bring them to this chamber. And again, it's really high humidity. If you were in here, you'd feel it's very humid. You can see it's moist. And they provide that high humidity to hopefully induce some disease. They want the disease to grow. And then they watch the plants. And so if there are any plants that are resistant to the disease, that's the plant they want. That's the one that they're going to go forward with and hopefully get it out to growers, to farmers, 
and will have some disease resistance. So that reduces their costs in the end. So that's another way that we use this greenhouse. One of the biggest issues in the greenhouse is insect control. And so there are a few things that we do in the greenhouse to uh, monitor and also to control. So as we go through the greenhouse, you'll see these yellow sticky cards everywhere. And they are very sticky. And we have them hanging. And so the yellow color attracts insects. And then once they land on there, they can't fly away. That kind of helps us to control them, but it also helps us to know what is in the greenhouse, what kind of bugs we're looking for. So on this card, uh, the bigger ones, the bigger flies that you see, those are mostly fungus gnats. Those love moist conditions and they're very common. They usually don't kill anything, but they're just annoying. Fly up your nose if you have too many. And then just looking on here, these very tiny dots, and you might not be able to see them, but they're very small. And even though they're very small, they cause a lot of damage. They're called thrips. And so they will attack a growing point on a lot of the, the plants and eat, get into the flower parts and eat the pollen. So that can be an issue. So um, we, we spray as little as we can. And part of the reason is, well, we don't like the sprays. But the other thing is that a lot of the sprays don't even work anymore in the greenhouse. So we make a big effort to um, use biological insects. And so in each of these pots, we've got these little sachets, okay? And we order these in from a company that come in from down east, and the company specializes in making biological controls. And so on the back of this, there's a tiny, tiny hole. Again, you might not be able to see it. It's probably about like two millimeters in length. But inside of here is some bran, and there are some beneficial mites. And so the mites actually crawl out of this tiny little hole and they'll crawl into the plant, into the soil, and they will attack thrips larvae that are in the soil. They might also crawl up the plants and eat the, the thrips, the, the bug itself. And so this is part of our beneficial insect controls. The other thing that we do, we bring in wasps, tiny wasps, when you think of wasps, it's not like the wasps that you find outside, but they're very small and they will go and attack aphids. And they'll actually stick their stinger in the aphid and lay eggs, like an alien. And then they lay, the eggs hatch out of the aphids. So the aphids die with these wasps hatching out of them. Sounds gruesome, but it's kind of cool. And then we have other things called mealybug destroyers, which look like little ladybugs. And they come in and they attack mealybugs. And so lots of different things. Oh, we also bring in nematodes, which are tiny, tiny worms that you can only see under a microscope. Again, we put them in the soil, they attack the larvae in the soil. So we try to do that as much as we can. And then we also use some chemicals that are not harmful to the, be the beneficials that we're bringing in. So that's how we use what we call integrated pest management, IPM. That's how we use it in the greenhouse. This greenhouse has day length curtains in it so we can control the day length. And that's pretty cool because plants, um, they flower and they grow according to the day length. And so for example, poinsettias, did you know they only turn red if they get less than 12 hours of day length every day? And then that makes the bracts turn red. So we can set this up so that the curtains automatically close and they will open and close at certain times during the day. And we even have beans that are from Central America and so we were growing beans in the greenhouse and they weren't flowering and we were like, why is that not happening? Well, it's because they needed a certain day length. So we brought the beans in here and once they only got less than 12 hours a day, that's when they started flowering. So it's kind of cool that plants will grow according to the sunlight. So one of the ways that we cool the greenhouse is that we can actually use shade curtains if we, if we need to. If the coolers aren't working and if the vents aren't enough and it's just too hot, we can close or open these shade curtains. And again, that's all automatic or we can do it manually. And that would be a third level of cooling. So first we open vents, second we try to use our evaporative coolers, and third, then we try to use the shade cloths. So this fan is just pulling air in from outside. So it's not actually cooling. Well, it is cooling because it's pulling air in from outside. 
but the other evaporative coolers have water running through them. This one doesn't. Because we're in a hallway, it's not as important that we actually cool for plant growth. But you do need this ventilation coming into the greenhouse or it will overheat. So this is just a huge fan in our hallway that pulls in air from outside to keep the hallways cool enough so they're comfortable for people to work in here. These evaporative coolers, this would be the second level of cooling after we use our vents. And so early in spring, we don't have the water hooked up. We just pull air from outside. But as we get into the summer, there's water hooked up. And so there's actually water running across fans in there. And as the, the air is pulled through the fans, it passes through the water and that actually cools the air and pushes cool air into the greenhouse. So that is how we um, cool the greenhouses. Now that's what we do here at the University of Saskatchewan, but a lot of commercial growers here in the province don't even have those evaporative coolers in their greenhouse. This is Eldon Siemens. He's our technician here in the greenhouse who really keeps this place going. And he's cleaning right now, which is a really important part of keeping bugs down in the greenhouse. So after someone harvests their plants, we take it out, we sweep, and then he has to go through and pressure wash each bench and all the walls in the greenhouse. You'll see there's an umbrella in the background and you're thinking, why do we have an umbrella in the greenhouse? Well, people spend hours in here crossing plants, uh, doing crosses with wheat and barley. In the middle of the summer, it gets really hot. So Eldon, who's always thinking about our workers, purchased a couple of umbrellas and we actually set up the umbrellas just for shade but it's, it's for the comfort of the technicians. And as I said, it gets really hot in these greenhouses. You can see this greenhouse is quite large. It was added on in uh, 2000, so there were two wings like this. And because it is so large, it's hard to keep the bugs in control in this greenhouse, but we managed to do that. So lighting in the greenhouse is really important. Uh, especially at this northern latitude in the winter. And most commercial greenhouses in Saskatchewan actually shut down over the winter because they don't have lighting and it's too expensive to run lighting. So what we are using in here are the 1000 watt high pressure sodium lights and they have the fullest spectrum. And so you might be saying, well, aren't you guys switching over to LEDs? Well, we grow so many different plants in here that we need a full spectrum light and LEDs have only certain wavelengths. So at this time, so far, there aren't LEDs available that have full spectrum lighting that would work in here yet. But we're hoping, you know, in maybe 10 years or less, um, we'll have something available. But yeah, lighting is really important. And in this greenhouse, you can see the, the roof is actually even curved. And that's gl curved glass up there, if you can believe it or not. And that's, again, to make the most efficient use of light uh, for the plants. So again, lighting is very important in the greenhouse. This bench has forage plants in it and the forage uh, researchers bring in a lot of bees to do their crossing for them. And so that box that you see on the bench that's lime green and, and white in color, we actually bring in a hive of bumblebees and they live in that hive. There's uh, sugar water in there and different things. They fly out of the box hopefully do some pollinating among the plants. Eventually, unfortunately, they, uh, they die in the box, but they are important pollinators. And big commercial greenhouses that grow tomatoes, where you need crossing flowers and things like that, they'll actually bring in lots of bumblebee hives and you'll see them throughout the commercial greenhouse. So yeah, the bees are really important in some of the greenhouse work. We are in the poly greenhouse here at the University of Saskatchewan Ag Greenhouses. And this greenhouse is very different from the ones that we were in before. The other greenhouses are all made of glass or have a glass covering. This one is more typical of what a Saskatchewan greenhouse grower could afford to build. Glass greenhouses are very expensive to build and expensive to upkeep. So this one has a poly roof, a double poly roof actually, which uh, they blow air through the two layers of poly and that helps provide some insulation in winter. It also has what we call a hard plastic walls, Lexan. Um, and so again, a plastic area. Now the thing that is a little bit unusual about this greenhouse, which a commercial grower probably wouldn't do, is that we have in-floor heating, which is really nice. 
And we also have a flood floor, which I'll demonstrate at some point here. The other thing also is that we do not have evaporative coolers here. So we're not cooling with air blowing through some water to cool off the greenhouse. All we're doing is bringing in um, air from outside to cool off the greenhouse. And because of that, this greenhouse can get really hot in summer. So we use the shade curtains a lot in here, we pull them. If we don't pull shade curtains and it's 30 degrees and sunny outside, it can easily become 45 to 50 degrees Celsius in here, which is way too hot. Even though we have a lot of tropical plants in here, they don't like it that hot. So we use the shade curtains a lot in here to cool off the greenhouse. But the way we heat it is that we have two unit heaters. Um, they're just like, you know, your furnace at home. They blow hot air uh, to cool the greenhouse. And again, we just cool it by opening up vents. So there are a lot of different plants in here, a lot of tropical plants. We use a, have a lot of horticulture plants in here. If you become a member of the horticulture club, you get to grow some vegetables in here during the winter. So a lot of different things. And I'll show you some of the different plants as we walk around. So this is a, one of the tropical plants we have growing here. It's actually called turmeric and they use the roots. You may have heard that it's kind of in the health food industry now. Good for like old people like me who have arthritis and cartilage issues. So yeah, you would use the roots in this. So that's one of the tropical plants we have in here. This is a papaya tree. We actually started this plant from a tiny little seed about six years ago, brought the seed in, grew it, and you can see it's massive now. And we usually have papaya fruit on it, which we have one little guy right now. I'm disappointed, usually we have five or six to show you. But um, yeah, we can grow papaya in here. This is a hydrangea plant. And if any of you know Dr. Bob Bors, who's our fruit breeder, well, he actually likes to dabble a bit in ornamentals. And so he's got these hydrangeas in here and he is growing them, he's saving the seed, he's making crosses. You never know what he's gonna come up with. So Dr. Bors is using these in, his, in a breeding program. He loves to, to breed ornamentals, that's part of his uh, fun. He actually has also bred a lot of different coleus, really unique coleus, which are down there. And those coleus have been bred in this greenhouse. And so you can see lots of different types in there. So that's part of what we're doing in this greenhouse, lots of different ornamentals and tropical plants. This tree that I'm standing under is actually a curry tree. And it's native to much warmer climates like India and those areas. And if you were standing here, you could actually smell it with me. It's very strong. So the curry is actually used from these little leaves. Uh, this leaf from the curry tree, this is actually what they grind up for the spice for curry. Very delicious, very strong if you were standing in here. So this is a banana um, forming here. There's a big flower right before you get all these bananas on here. And some of our uh, international um, technicians, when they see that banana flower, they actually want the flower because it's a delicacy for them to eat. Sometimes we give them the flower and sometimes we're like, no, you can't have the flower, we want bananas. And so these are forming on the tree. It was about twice as long as this, okay? Um, we cut it off though, because otherwise it gets way too heavy and will break the plant. These plants are just growing in pots, not in the ground. So we have to be careful that we don't break the plant right off. But yeah, from the time we see a banana till we actually have yellow bananas, it's probably three, three months, three, four months, something like that. And uh, if you're in the, happen to be in the greenhouse at the time and we have yellow bananas, you can come and take a taste test. This tall plant that I'm standing beside is a sugarcane plant. And again, grows in tropical areas all over the world. Uh, what they do is they actually will cut this part and then squeeze it and that's how, the juice that they get out is what they use for the sugar for the cane. So this is a sugar cane. In behind it here, this more narrow leaved plant. Okay, I'll pull it through. This is actually lemongrass. So if you've ever had Asian cooking that has some lemongrass in it, well they, again, they use the leaves. So they would break off these leaves. And if you were here, I'd pass this around and you'd smell it and it smells very lemony, very good. And uh, that's lemongrass and how they use it. They would just cut that up and use it in cooking. So this is our flood floor and it fills up from the bottom. We have a holding tank and it floods twice a day in the summer and it will fill up two to three inches. All the pots have holes in the bottom. And so it's a really quick way to water a lot of plants. Our water has fer fertilizer in it. 
So we're fertilizing the plants as well. The benefit is besides we don't have to water by hand, the other benefit is the leaves don't get wet. And so it will reduce the incidence of disease on the plants. We are looking at the computer screen here at the agriculture greenhouse. Uh, this is what runs the whole greenhouse. It's the, the brains behind the operation. Um, it is an Argus control system. So all of the greenhouses are listed on this computer screen. Um, 15 different greenhouses, the climate, the humidity, um, when things turn off, when they turn on. So we don't go around and open vents or close vents when it's hot. We program it into the computer. If it gets too hot, the vents open up. If it gets too windy, the vents have to close now. And then the evaporative coolers come on. So everything is computerized. Um, we are actually hooked up to the main center, which is located in White Rock, British Columbia. So if things go wrong and we're not here, alarms go off, they call us on our phone, the, the computer calls us on our phone, we can check what's going on. If for some reason we can't fix it, we can contact them in White Rock and say, hey, can you help us out? Or we'll have to contact our facilities people here at the university if some mechanical thing is broke down. So it's, it's really imperative that we have this system. We can set up all kinds of things, but yeah, it makes our job a lot easier. My name is Karen Tonino, and I'm a professor in the Department of Plant Sciences, College of Agriculture and Bioresources, University of Saskatchewan. These dogwoods here kind of symbolize why I came up here. I'm an abiotic or environmental stress physiologist, and I study how plants can survive and adapt to cold, heat, drought, salt, all kinds of abiotic stresses. And when I first came up here in 1989, you know, people were apologizing to me. You know, oh, you know, sorry about the weather. I'm, you know, it's going to be really cold for you. But actually, that's what brought me up here. So, you know, I love it when it's stressful because we can really see and delineate differences between what is hardy and what is not. And, you know, as you can see with these dogwoods, um, yeah, over time, and these were planted in the 1990s, early 1990s. These uh, dogwoods were first published by my PhD supervisor in 1966, and they published on various ecotypes. The same species, different ecotypes adapted to different regions across North America. We kind of took that one step further and we bred the northernmost and the southernmost in reciprocal crosses and produced 191 uh, segregating populations which we characterized individually for dormancy. And why are we interested in dormancy? Well, <clears throat> dormancy in plants, especially perennial plants, in order for the plants to survive the winter, they need to first shut down or go dormant. And then they can acclimate or increase their cold hardiness. But until they go dormant, they don't really shift over. So the earlier that a plant goes dormant, then the earlier it can start to build up reserves for the winter. So these segregating populations enable us to really look at the mechanisms of how dormancy occurs and what regulates that early shutdown. So the northernmost from Northwest Territories uh, shut down really early and they're, way, they're in the back there. And the southernmost, the Utah types, shut down really late. And if they shut down too late, there's just not enough time to build up reserves and survive the winter. So a lot of the, the dead ones you see are probably more from the Utah types than from the Northwest Territory types. So that's why we study uh, dormancy. And uh, that's really what uh, brought me up here. And we study not only cold hardiness, but we study heat and drought. This year, we had historic, you know, high temperature stress, drought stress. 
and we're studying how we could you know improve plant adaptation to you know this environment this changing environment is probably going to get worse over time and through either cultural practices or through uh, physiological uh, means and we really uh, try to complement with the breeding programs i'm a physiologist but we like to link with breeding programs and give them tools for selection on what will really make a better adapted plant. We are standing in Patterson Arboretum and this Arboretum is just a little over 50 years old. It was started in 1966 with the first trees planted at that time. It was part of what we call the Prairie Woody Ornamental Regional Trial. And it was started by Morden Research Station, which was under the direction of Agriculture Canada at the time. And they had several sites throughout the prairies. They were testing woody ornamental trees to see what would be hardy on the prairies, what could possibly be in the future and what wouldn't survive. And so the university was part of that research. But we've kept it going. We are one of the few sites that actually still maintains their woody trials. The trials actually ended in the 90s and there was a report written. But we keep our site going and right now we have over 800 different woody ornamentals, trees and shrubs. And so you might be wondering what is an arboretum? Well that's a place where you, you see woody species of plants. It could be vines, it can be shrubs, and it could be trees. The arboretum was named after Dr. Cecil Patterson who was the head of horticulture for over 50 years and that's how we get the name Patterson Garden Arboretum. I'm standing under one of the bigger trees here in the Arboretum. It's oh, at least 50 years old and it's one of the poplar trees and you can see it's massive. And so when you come in here you can see wow that's a massive tree but poplar trees are not recommended for urban areas. They're way too big for a yard and then they also their roots come close to the ground and so you can't even maintain your lawn or whatever is happening there. So that's part of what the, the purpose of the Arboretum is for education. And so as students, you can come here and look at all the different trees and shrubs and see what might work well in a yard, what might not work well. The other reason we have the Arboretum is for conservation. We have some species in here that are either endangered or on the list of endangerment. So behind me is the dragon spruce tree. It was planted back in 1972 and it is on the list of endangered species. It is native to parts of China and um, because of urbanization and climate change, um, the tree is actually endangered in China. And so for some reason, our, the people that worked here in the 70s decided to put, plant this in and we're very grateful because um, it is endangered. And so it's the, the the point of arboretums throughout the world, not just Patterson Arboretum, but is for conservation. So we can, you know, save trees that may be endangered in one area of the world and we're saving them here. And that can happen in all sorts of arboretums. So Patterson Arboretum really is important for education, for conservation, for diversity, and for watching the climate change. And especially education, of course, for the University of Saskatchewan. We are at a zone three hardiness level here in the Arboretum. And so we can grow plants that are recommended for zone three B and anything colder. Back in the 1960s, we would have only been zone two. So it shows how things have changed. So the Arboretum is also a place where you can see a lot of different life species in here. You can see fungi growing in amongst the mulch. There might be different lichens on the signs. We have little animals running around. Sometimes we even have deer, which cause damage in the Arboretum. But um, yeah, it's a place where there's a, it's its own ecosystem going on here in the Arboretum. Now I'm standing under a flowering crab tree and it's actually the cult of our name is Thunderchild. And that was developed here on the prairies, I believe at the Saskatoon Forestry Farm back in the day. And the unique thing about this is it's a beautiful flowering crab uh, developed here. It's also resistant to fire blight, which can be a huge problem in apple tree species. And so we have a lot of um, prairie trees here that were developed in the prairies here in the Arboretum. We don't have all of them, but some of them. And 
as I said, it's called Thunder Child. So that's a cult of our name. And that refers to something that was cultivated by a person. So something that was bred by a person. So sometimes you have cultivars and sometimes you just have species names. And so those are things that occur naturally in the wild. A seedling, on the other hand, a seedling is something that's developed from seed. With the cultivar, once they find this cultivar tree, the only way to replicate it is not from the seeds because those flowers have been crossed and so you'll get something totally different again. But you would actually have to take a cutting and clone it. So when something is a cultivar, to make more of them, you actually have to clone them. You take cuttings or you graft them or whatever it is. So that's how you would get this thunder child uh, flowering crab. Now, if you look at this tree, we have a lot of different uh, branches all over the place on it. So you can see they're growing all over. They're not like specially pruned or anything like that. And that's one of the uh, philosophies here in the Arboretum is we don't go around and prune things to be perfect like you would in your yard. We prune them if they're in the way or if they're dangerous. But the idea is that people can see how a tree grows naturally. And so some trees might be really well behaved and they don't need much upkeep. And for example, if you see a linden tree in here, usually they're very neat and tidy. You don't have to do a lot of work with them. Whereas this guy, this thunder child crab, you should actually be pruning off all these trees if it was in your yard. You'd want it to look nice and neat and clean. And so that's part of what you can see here in the Arboretum. How things grow naturally and that's what we want it to look like. That's what we want you to see. Some people say, well, it looks messy in there. You guys aren't pruning anything. But that's the look we want. Behind me here is what we call a Siberian larch tree. Sometimes they're confused with tamarack. Uh, some people call them tamarack. They're not the same thing. Uh, they look the same, but botanically they're different and I'm not going to go into all the details of that. But this one actually is native to, as it suggests, Siberia. But we do have native ones here in Saskatchewan, up north. They're called Western Larch. They look very similar, exactly like this. So the unique thing about this is the needles are very soft. It is considered a conifer, but it loses its needles in fall. It turns a nice bright yellow. And so if you go up to it, you can just run your fingers along here and all these needles will fall off. And um, yeah, it looks kind of bare in, in winter, I have to warn you. Looks kind of sad, but uh, a beautiful tree, definitely again, underutilized, but it can get fairly big in a yard. So you have to make sure that you have a decent sized urban yard if you're going to grow one of these. Patterson Garden Arboretum is part of the University of Saskatchewan campus. It's been here over 50 years. We are located at the corner of Preston Avenue and College Drive. You can see the university in the background. And it is open 24-7, 365 days of the year. It's open to the public. Come and check out the trees, look at the shrubs. Uh, for education, it's a great place to have some peace and quiet. And you're welcome here anytime. <music>